Okay, let's get started. Thank you everyone for uh, telling us where you're coming from. Uh, my name is Arthur Samuelson. I'm the program director at the Rowe Conference Center, and we're located in Western Massachusetts, a beautiful corner of the state. We've been here for um, in 2024. It'll be 100 years. Um, the last 50, we're, since we've been running summer camps, in the last 50 years, we've been running programs such as the one we're going to hear about tonight, uh, programs on spirituality, um, personal growth, uh, all the creative arts, nature, and social change. And of course, in the last two years, we've not been able to do any of that live on site, um, but we are slowly returning. Um, in fact, we have a really interesting program coming up this weekend uh, with uh, these two artists who go by the name the Yes Men, um, who've done projects all over, stunts all over the world to attract attention um, to good causes and to bad things that are happening. Um, and they're going to do this program called Advanced Mischief for Activists, Artists, and Troublemakers. Uh, Roe has a long history of doing programs on, on in, in social change, starting from the very beginning, uh, when we had people like the Berrigan brothers and Abby Hoffman all the way through um, these last 50 years. And uh, we are so excited to be able to offer Sherry and um, Tim's program, um, which is going to happen on the weekend of October 7th through 10. So it's a three-day program and um, that they'll tell you a little bit more about. And Fia, my colleague, let me introduce my colleague Fia, uh, who is in New Hampshire. Um, she will put the URL into the chat so that you can see that. But you also receive from us a video, a link to the video for tonight's program that'll have more information. So as I said, it's an honor and, and a delight for me to introduce Sherry. Uh, Sherry is an indigenous attorney, activist, and teacher from the Penobscot Nation. She's the author of the award-winning book, Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wis Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change. And she's contributed to 11 anthologies. She's the founder of the Land Peace Foundation. She's a trustee for the American Indian Institute, an advisory council member for the for Nia Taro's Indigenous Land Guardianship Program a board member for the Post Carbon Institute and a foundational member of the US Act Climate Change Development Team. And joining her is Tim. Tim De Christopher is an environmental activist and co-founder of Peaceful Uprising and the Climate Disobedience Center. Um, he's widely known for disrupting a Bureau of Land Management auction in order to protect over 150,000 acres of public lands in Utah, for which he had the honor of spending nearly two years in prison, um, despite the Obama administration later determining that the auction itself was illegal. So welcome, welcome, Sherry and, and Tim. I'm so excited about this program and the one that's coming up. I don't, I, I don't always I know that I'm supposed to feel that way about all our programs, and, and I do feel about that, uh, like that for a lot of them. But for this one in particular, this one speaks to me, and I, and I hope it will speak to all of you. So welcome, Sherry and Tim. Thank you, Arthur. Kwe Pasitawin. Hello, everyone. And the see one of them was it, and the geo of the scary. Pasoda and the Alabama was it, and the scary, and the Kakabus, and the Dubai. Um, I just want to introduce myself in my language to acknowledge my ancestors. My name in uh, my language is Wanhamu Gwasit. I am from the Penobscot Nation. My family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe of Tibayak. So I also just want to acknowledge and honor all of your ancestors that you bring with you to this event and to your ancestors as well. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, so. Tim and I have come here tonight to share some stories with you about our own personal journeys uh, and how we have shifted and transformed a little bit um, and um, how that's helped us to ground our own lives. And I'm gonna let Tim tell you a little bit about what we're gonna be doing this evening. 
Great. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for tuning into this. Uh, we're going to be kind of sharing some of the, the life updates or transitions that we've both been going through in the past few years um, and, and how that has impacted our work in the world. Um, and also how it has impacted our relationship to the earth and, and our relationship to, to each other and, and to people um, and, and the way that it's just impacted our own spiritual life and sense of self. Um, and then we'll be opening up to questions from all of you. Um, so I'll get started with kind of some of the transitions that have, that have happened for me. Um, I spent a long time working as, as a climate activist fighting fossil fuel industry. Um, and a lot of that work did involve some, some direct actions um, that were happening on a, on a regular basis. But a, a lot of it really in the day to day was, was pretty focused on head work. Uh, I was often using words to try to shift systems in our, our society. Um, or using symbols, even a lot of the actions that we were doing were, were really about symbols to shift narratives within that system. Um, and, you know, for my background before that, I had been a wilderness guide, I had been an athlete, um, I'd always been a pretty embodied person. And so in that period when I was an activist doing all that head work, I was really craving that that reconnection to my own body and that reconnection to the earth. Um, and so a few years ago, I uh, started actually taking steps to uh, meet that need that I was having for more embodiment in, in my day-to-day -day life. And, and so I went to massage school and became a massage therapist, uh, which very literally was you know, a very embodied way of, of doing work in the world and, and connecting with others. Uh, and at the same time, I was doing uh, a lot more physical labor of beginning to farm. Um, I was living on a farm in Rhode Island in, in 2020 during the, the pandemic um, and, and doing that work all day long. And then um, beginning of this year, I moved to Maine and became a farmer up here, a full-time farmer. Uh, and right now I've been farming in, in Camden, but pretty soon I'm gonna be transitioning up here to this land, Wajukum Tolkina, and be farming here with, with Sherry. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, so yeah, and that, that shift for me um, has been, um, one, it's, it's felt really grounding. Uh, in my body, um, but it has also shifted the way that I've been thinking about the work of social change, uh, because um, I was really caught up in the sense of urgency as as a climate activist, um, and and kind of constantly fighting these these new struggles, um, and of course generally losing those struggles. I mean, that's really the story of the climate movement over the past few decades is um, that a lot of people have, have worked really hard and um, by and large fallen short of, uh, of what was needed. Um, and, and so that's been pretty frustrating for, for a lot of us. Um, and, and so it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's one much more fulfilling to be doing work where I can see the impacts of my work, even if it's on a small scale. Um, if that's, you know, working on somebody as a massage therapist and, and seeing that not come out or working as a farmer uh, and seeing the impacts of, of what I'm doing and knowing that that's having a, a difference, even on a, on a small scale. Um, and so it's, it's also shifted, um, kind of my sense of my own self and my own importance. Because as a climate activist, we look at that, that huge crisis that we're facing on a big systemic level um, and say, okay, my job is to stop that. Or we look at these big systems, political systems, economic systems, and 
energy systems. And we say, okay, our job is to, to shift that whole thing. Uh, and, and so we have to think of ourselves then on that kind of level um, with that level of self-importance. Uh, but, but as farmer, we're working on, on such a smaller scale, like, okay, you know, my job is to, to plant these seeds here and take care of them and to, to build some soil here um, and to, to heal this piece of land or, or increase the fertility of this piece of land. And, and so it's, it's a little more humbling, but also um, more liberating in a way of working on that appropriate scale uh, that, that doesn't, uh, it doesn't get into the sense of grandiosity that I think has been fueling a lot of the crises that we're facing, the climate crisis and, and many others. Um, so it's, I think, helping, helping me to get back into a place that feels aligned with the real long-term needs uh, of our world. Do you want to talk about the transition that has been going on in your life? Sure. Thank you, Tim. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that you know, Tim and I have known each other for quite a quite a long time, for a number of years, about eight, eight and a half years. And um, when we first met, we were both these kind of like fearsome figures out there doing this work in the world. And we were both kind of intimidated by each other uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and our lives have taken these parallel tracks that, you know, when we started having conversation about some of these things, um, realizing how, how we've, we both have gone through these transformations that have really changed the way that we show up in the world. Um, and for me, that happened um, as a result of becoming very ill. So I got um, really sick uh, for a period of time and uh, had, you know, to be very, very careful about the amount of energy that I expended in the world and uh, started to learn over time what were the things that I was doing that were depleting my energy and what were the things that I was doing that were increasing my energy uh, or my life force essentially is what, what it came down to for me. Um, and so uh, what I learned during that time was that because I was involved with a lot of um, what I would say is deconstructive activism at the time. And, um, you know, the toppling, trying to topple systems um, and uh, be disruptive in, in ways that were um, I guess, I guess uh, destructive in a lot of ways. Um, and so when when I would engage in those types of activities that I had traditionally been engaged in in regard to activism um, and would be in a crowd of a number of other people who were engaging in those same kinds of activities with that same energy cent uh, centered on uh, deconstruction of, um, of some activity organization um, that we were uh, operating in opposition to, I found that it took me three or four days to be able to have enough energy to do anything else again. Um, and when I engaged in activities that were actively building the world that I wanted to live in, it would boost my energy for days at a time uh, following that activity. And so what I quickly started to, uh, um, you know, kind of attribute that to was, was I aligned with the energy of death or was I aligned with the energy of life? Um, because I was noticing that it was actually sucking the life out of me, out of my body, um, and, or elevating the energy of my body. Uh, and that really caused me to, to think about what I was doing and how I was doing it. And that was a time for me when I, you know, coined this phrase, uh, conquest activism, uh, where I started recognizing that I was trying to dismantle systems of conquest by engaging in acts of conquest uh, in some ways uh, or activities that were aligned with conquest um, where I was trying to um, attack, unseat, 
and replace with, you know, the person or the structure or the system that I thought was best. So it's just this constant cycle of king of the mountain uh, being acted out over and over again by different groups where we firmly believe that if our people are on the top of the mountain, then we're going to win. We get knocked off. The other people get on top of the mountain. We firmly believe we're going to lose. You know, I mean, it just becomes this repetitive cycle of, of knocking one another down. And I, I realized that that just wasn't very effective. Um, not only was it not being effective out in the world, but it was having a real definitive toll on my body, right? Uh, I, was, I was feeling it uh, in my body. And so um, I think that another thing that happened for me during that time was that I, I had um, this real affinity for the color orange. Um, and I later learned that that really is about vibrancy and restoring your life energies, but I was just drawn to it. Like somebody craves chocolate. I was drawn to this color. Um, and so I had this really thin orange blanket that I used to carry around with me. And when I would feel really depleted, I would just lay it out on the grass wherever I was. And I would lay my body on the earth with my heart down, um, touching the earth and just really trying to reconnect to the heart of the earth. Um, and, um, you know, during that time, what I, what I kept recognizing, what I kept hearing and feeling in my body was that there was a symbiotic relationship between me and the earth, not in ways that we think about normally, but that I couldn't get well unless I was working to heal the earth, that the earth can't heal unless we're working to heal ourselves. So our own healing, the work that we're doing to, um, you know, realign ourselves, um, I think is, is something that's, uh, part of this process, right? And it's a, it's a critical part of this process. And, um, you know, so I started thinking about that and I'll just say one more thing on this and then we'll move on. But I, I came across this quote recently, um, from a book that, uh, somebody sent to me and it's a pretty amazing quote by Angela Davis. And, uh, what she says here in this quote, um, is I think our notions of what counts as radical have changed over time. Self-care and healing and attention to the body and the spiritual dimension, all of this is now part of radical social justice struggles. That wasn't the case before. And I think that now we're thinking deeply about the connection between interior life and what happens in the social world, not as though they're exclusive, but they are deeply interrelated. And one of the things that I, you know, that I'm thinking about is, you know, as we're creating a new world, where we're seeking to build a new world, uh, who's going to populate that world? And how do I become, as Angela Davis is suggesting, how do I become a citizen of the world that I want to inhabit? And so then that really shifted my work away from this kind of outward protection of the earth towards uh, really looking more deeply at how can I be a facilitator of healing um, in, in meaningful ways in the world. So I guess that was a transformation for me of shifting away from this work outside to shifting back toward more embodied work, but also larger spiritual work in connection to my activism. And so how has how have those experiences shifted you towards a, a deeper spiritual relationship with the earth? Well, I think, uh, you know, and this is something that, that I've been very grateful to have had lots of conversation with you about, um, that, you know, shifting from that outward protection to um, a more personal relationship with the earth uh, and connecting to a sense of like really deep love, um, you know, uh, not just my love for the earth, but having, having some of that come back to me when I'm laying with my heart on the ground, trying to feel into the heart of the earth and having, having a real response, having something very tangible come back to me, um, and into my body. And, um, one of the stories that, that I, I'll, I'll say two things about this and then pass it on. Um, but one of the things that, uh, the stories that I love is, um, 
I looked at a lot of land before coming to this place um, that has become Wajukum Tiltina. Uh, and there were a lot of places that kind of grabbed my imagination. There are places that, you know, kind of even tugged at my heart. Um, but this land here actually grabbed hold of my feet. And so uh, when, when I first came to look at this land here, I brought with me um, two, two of my board members and we were walking up, up, the, up in one of the fields and one of the board members had said something to me in, in our language, because they're also a native person. Uh, and I responded to them in the language. And we both literally felt like this energy rise up from the earth. It was like the earth sat up and it like reached out and grabbed our feet. Um, and having that kind of time prior to that, when I was laying with my heart on the ground, having that connection with the earth, I feel like it opened me to have this relationship where I recognize that not only am I like reaching with love towards the earth, but that the earth is reaching back toward me. And um, it's changed the whole nature of my understanding of my place in the world, which I've written about. Many people know that I've written about um, feeling this, this sense of, of boundless connection. Um, with all life, uh, but understanding that this is not just this amorphous energetic um, presence out there, but that there is actually tangible life connected to me under my feet, uh, in the trees all around me, that's actually reaching, reaching for me with a loving presence, um, has helped me to understand my concepts of, of web of life teachings much more deeply. And these teachings of, of entanglement, which I've talked about a lot. You can find all kinds of videos of that talk somewhere else. I won't get into that tonight, but you know, understanding this, this, um, this relationship that we have with the rest of life, that we're all part of one living being. And uh, even though we have been separated in some ways physically, uh, we will never be disconnected energetically or spiritually, which is why when the mother whale is carrying her dead baby around. We feel that deep in our body. We feel the pain of that deep in our body. Uh, we feel the pain of, of the other beings in the natural world as they're suffering deep in our body, in panic, in loneliness, uh, you know, in immense grief. Uh, and that, that these, these feelings that we're experiencing as a, as a um, reflection of our interrelatedness with the rest of life, they're not evidence of something being wrong with us, but something being righted within us. And that in the process of recognizing that my deepening connection to this spiritual relationship with all of life is something that's being realigned and righted within my being and knowing that I can somehow um, make that process and that practice part of my contribution to healing the earth feels like this release of relief in some ways, but also an incredible honor to be able to um, participate in this exchange of energy with life that, um, you know, reminds us that we're, we're all just part of one vibration and frequency, trying to harmonize ourselves with one another. And so I, I'm really interested in, um, you know, how the transformations in your life have changed your relationship with you. Yeah, I think in, in ways that I think are pretty aligned with what you were talking about. Um, from, from my time as an environmental activist, I think I spent a lot of time looking through the lens of the ways in which humans are dependent on, on the earth and on the, the natural environment around us, uh, about how dependent we are on a stable climate, how dependent we are on, on clean water, and on forests, and on all these other resources. Uh, and, and of course, that's true, but it's um, only part of the story of our relationship with the earth. Uh, and, 
am now working as as a farmer with my hands in the soil every day. Um, I can I can really see the ways in which um, I'm an active participant in this in this ecosystem um, and can have an important role to play um, and and can be part of that beneficial web of life and um, and so it's shifted me from focusing primarily on our dependency on the earth to our interdependency with the earth and and you know that that puts me in that in that system um, and and I think the the powerful thing for me has been um, in those moments when I'm I'm working with the land and um, can can see the positive results of of what I'm doing can see more life springing up and a, and a more rich abundance of life springing up and and when I allow myself to like really sit in in that experience and feel what's going on I can feel gratitude from the earth and you know a, a lot of my life uh, has uh, um, I've I've been really intentional about expressing my gratitude for the earth um, and you know felt like um, like I was doing a good job of remembering my gratitude for the earth um, and and for me it was a, a different experience of feeling gratitude from the earth that um, that really opened up my heart and made me um, feel a lot of joy and a lot of peace within myself because um, something that that I realized or maybe admitted to myself a few years ago was that a lot of my activism, really, really pretty much all of my activism was really coming from a motivation of, of repentance. Um, of coming from ultimately a place of shame, of thinking of myself as um, a bad person in some ways, and thinking that that activism that I was doing, that work for a better world, um, was how I repent for some like inherent flaw in myself, and how I kind of earned my place. Um, through that work in, in that web of life. Um, and, and something that a friend of mine recently wrote, Rabbi Shoshana Friedman, is that, um, you know, as, as she was transitioning in her own activism as well, uh, she said, I'm worthy of love, not because I'm saving this world, but because I am of it, because I am part of it. Um, and that really deeply resonated for me. And I think that's, that's part of what I was feeling um, when I had that experience of gratitude from the earth. Uh, and it's, you know, it's helped me reflect on kind of um, what, what activism that is not motivated by repentance can really even look like for me. Um, and I think that's, that's still an open, question for, for my future. You know, one of the things that I, I heard you say that I thought was really poetic um, was that when you started shifting your energy toward the earth that you love and away from these power systems that enrage you, that there was something that happened personally for you. And I would love to know how, um, you know, how has all of this transformation and shifting, how has it impacted you personally in your life? Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that when we met years, many years ago, mm -hmm. um, we were both like 
pretty tough in our public personas out in the world. Um, like we were both warriors and, yeah. and fighters um, and, and intimidated each other a little bit. Uh, and, and yeah, I think part of that was because we were uh, confronting these unjust or evil systems uh, in, in the way that we were approaching the world. Um, and so we had to be pretty tough. We had to wear that armor. Um, and, um, you know, wear it around our whole lives. And, you know, as we, as we both have transitioned, definitely for me, I've, I've felt this, um, as I'm spending most of my time now working with the earth that I love so much and that I'm so grateful for, um, I don't feel the need to have that kind of toughness right. and to wear that kind of armor and um, feel like I can be much more open and can um, don't need to like hide that soft part of myself and that um, that caring part of myself. Uh, and and I think from our talks, it sounds like you had that that same thing, and I and that's what I've seen in you. And right. so, you know, I think when we, um, when we started connecting more recently and both of us had made that transition where we um, didn't have to hide our softness anymore. We could, we were willing to open up and show that side of each other. Um, we, we saw something new right. in each other that um, we both really loved. And I think that that is part of what opened the space for us to fall in love right. in, in the way that we have, um, which has been really the, the most exciting part of my life this year. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this, this uh, transition for us is part of what has made that possible. Because um, I know for me, um, seeing that, that softness and gentleness in you um, was at first a real surprise, but it's also really the thing that I love most about you. What's, what's that been like for you? Well, I, you know, I think that um, the thing about this whole journey that's so kind of miraculous for me is that um, we've always both been these people on the inside. Um, and, you know, having known each other and moved through this, that we had to go through this whole process of, you know, being out there in the world, getting reconnected with our own bodies, you in your way, me through illness, um, getting reconnected to the earth. Uh, and it feels like, you know, that rootedness in that um, connection to the earth um, has helped us to finally connect with the roots of our own being. Um, you know, and I like to think about it like, you know, a, a, a young shoot coming up from the ground that there's just this tenderness in that, in that new bud. And, you know, we've really found this sweetness and tenderness in each other that we hadn't expected. Um, but I think that that journey has been facilitated largely by our love of the earth and also our spiritual lives, mm -hmm. because we, we recognize that, um, you know, we had to travel you know, these kind of parallel paths and uh, kind of looking at each other on the other side of the road for a long time um, to get to the place where we could finally come to a place where we recognize that there's a sacredness at the center of, of what we have with one another um, and what we have the potential to create together. And so um, recognizing that, you know, the whole universe had to kind of conspire on our behalf in order to take us through those lessons and bring us here also gives me this incredible sense of gratitude for um, that entire journey um, that we've gone through. And it's, it's been through that going to ground, right? This is the name of the, the talk that we were able to find our way home um, and find our way home to one another in a way that when we first met never would have occurred to us because behind those tough facades, we were both looking for that gentleness of heart that um, that we both were needing so badly. 
yeah. right? And and so you know, it's been it's been kind of a kind of a wonderful surprise for us both. Yeah. And um, also, I think you know our our pathways lead us to the places where we're meant to be when we're meant to be there. And you know, a moment earlier, we wouldn't have been ready for this. So yeah, I think it's pretty we're pretty lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Should we open it up for questions now? Yeah. Do you have any questions that came up for you in the course of us talking, or, or are you ready to hear questions from, from the folks here with us? I'm ready to hear their questions. Yeah. And Fia is going to be curating questions. Um, so if, if you have questions, um, then you can, um, share them here uh, and um, they should just write them in the chat and I'll um, I'll pick the order or whatever I'll do them in order if I can so okay. yeah so write your questions in the chat um, and um, we'd be happy to answer answer any any questions that you may have um, one of the things that uh, I have a fellowship program that um, I run through my organization, and one of the things that you know we've talked about is the healing of the wounds that we've carried, not just our own, but the healing of the larger wound um, of not only our species but of the earth. And the uh, we've both carried a significant amount of that burden on our own shoulders, or felt like we were carrying a lot of it on our own shoulders. And so uh, one of the questions that I had for my um, fellows over the weekend to take home and to contemplate was what is the relationship you have with the wound uh, that you're carrying or the wounds that you're carrying um, and which and which one of those wounds determines your relationship with others uh, and the ways that you engage with others. So I think that um, one of the things that we, you know, hope people will will feel inspired to do as a result of us sharing the story is to um, really do your own work to, to follow whatever pathway or whatever journey it is that is gonna lead you back to your sense of grounded fullness and embodiment um, and connection with the truth that lies at the core of your being. Um, because what we want is we wanna create a citizenry that's connected to their hearts. We wanna create a citizenry that's ready to step into the world that we're all actively working together to build. Um, so something to consider while you're putting your questions in the chat. Uh, I think you can also probably, um, yeah, do you want to? I, I have one question so far. Can you say anything about how the non-human animals fit into finding your way home? Yes. Um, hi, Amy. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we, we forget oftentimes is that we're, we're just creatures in the natural world. And we've elevated ourselves in our own minds. It's part of our illusion of separation. Um, and we're, we're in continuous relationship with the animals. And I think that, you know, one of the things that for me personally in this time of, of the pandemic has been really paying attention to our relatives in the bird nations, the winged nations, um, because they're really working hard to communicate with us to help us to understand the ways that we have become imbalanced with the rest of life. Uh, and I think that uh, the animals oftentimes show us uh, how we've become imbalanced with the rest of life uh, and uh, also bring us back. We have story in our tradition about um, the first illness and the first illness was given to human beings by the animals because human beings had lost their way and had fallen out of balance with the rest of life and, and had begun harming other species as a re result of the imbalance that they were experiencing. And so we have that deep relationship for us as Kijinawa peoples, our first relationship is with the animals. Our first treaty is with uh, is with the animals, um, and so uh, you know, understanding how um, 
animals fit into finding your way home is understanding how we fit into the rest of life with the animals. It's all, it's all part of that interdependency and interrelatedness and inter interconnectedness. Um, but you know, everything that we do affects them. And the evidence of that is, is found in, you know, that story that I just told about the mother whale who carried her baby around for 17 days, trying to show us what we were doing to their ecosystem. Uh, how can we live in a balanced life um, without making sure that everybody else has the same opportunity and right to life that we're claiming for ourselves? We have to make sure that all species are included in that. What would you like to say about that? Um, I mean, for, for me, non-human animals played some literal role in, um, in this path for me. The farm that I was on in, in Rhode Island, we had dairy sheep and my part of my role every morning was was milking those sheep um and and so i found myself kind of operating on their rhythms um and um uh, and being in a a relationship where um they were they were domesticated but it was also clear that like I was going to have to operate on on their terms, right. you know, in in a way that they understood, because uh, they were pretty stubborn, and <laughs> um, and so it it um, it definitely taught me some patience, um, and and it was part of what broke me out of like that sense of urgency that yeah. that I was talking about, yeah. you know, you know that these things um, are. Are going to happen in their time, and yeah. um, and I think that's true, like on on a larger system as well. Yeah. Um, you know, nature never hurries. Yeah. It, um, things always happen on their own timeline, mm -hmm. um, and we can we can impact that, we can engage with that, um, but we're not in control of it. And, for me, that's what a lot of the, a lot of my experiences with the non-human world, whether it's, whether it's animals, whether it's with a river or whatever, it's um, about remembering that we're not in control. We can, we can steer our boat down this river, um, but we don't build the river. Right. There's, there's another question. How might this process unfold for those in urban settings? Um, well, you know, for me, it, it began in an urban setting when I was living in, in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and we had a, a tiny backyard where I was spending more and more of my time splitting wood and uh, you know, trying to grow as many vegetables as we could, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I found that, that ultimately I had to get out of that urban environment. Um, and, you know, I, I know that a lot of people are tied to it. I was tied to it um, because of my work and my community and, and lots of reasons. Um, but ultimately, I, I don't think that most of our urban environments are very humane. Um, I think that um, the ways of engaging with the earth are, are limited and, and you have to like really put effort into it in an urban environment. So one of the things that I was doing was building community gardens in, in Rhode Island. Uh, that, tried to, that I was trying to get is one, to create those spaces for, for others, but also for myself. Uh, where, where we could be getting our hands in the dirt on a more regular basis. Um, but you're still within those rhythms of an urban environment that uh, it is a, a totally different kind of stress on the body than being in a, um, a real genuine natural environment. Uh, so, um, I think it's I think it's a balance of trying to change those urban environments 
and also giving yourself space outside of those natural environments uh, or outside of those urban environments, you know, getting into the wilderness, uh, getting into rural areas for, for as much time as you can. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there are so many people who are doing things uh, like tearing up the parking lots and building community gardens in urban areas. Um, and I, I think that we need to reclaim our wild spaces. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to dig up parking lots and to plant gardens. Um, but also it's really important to, to recognize that one of the things that has been proven to be true in, um, is that the energy of the earth doesn't, doesn't transfer through asphalt. Like it'll come up through some forms of untreated concrete, but it it doesn't transfer through through asphalt. So you have to get your feet off from that and onto some ground where you can have a real energy exchange with the earth. Um, and I think that those are things that that need to be created. And I think about uh, we have this program here in um, in Maine that I remember. Um, I I moved away for a period of time and. You know, went to law school and worked out in different parts of the country. And um, before I was called back home, um, right around the time when Tim and I met each other is when I first I had first moved back home. And um, there's this program called Fresh Air Kids where they bring kids from the city to Maine so that they can have this experience with fresh air. And I, I feel like we need to have a program like that for adults where, um, you know, you're, you're working with a group of friends or um, finding opportunities to get out from the place where you're not only, not only is there like congestion space-wise uh, in urban settings, but the amount of noise um, and different frequencies that are coming at you are, are so disruptive to your bodily systems that you really have to get yourself out of that and get yourself to a place where you can, you know, kind of quiet your mind and quiet your spirit and get regrounded and recentered and um, get away from your devices. We just did a river trip um, out in Utah where everybody's like, well, what was the best part of the trip for you? And I was like having no cell phone reception for the whole week that we were out there, um, you know, just being completely unplugged and, um, not having to worry. It took like days for my shoulders to come down um, and for me to stop like being like in anticipation of when is the next call going to come from the next thing that somebody needs me to do right away. Um, and uh, I feel like we need to give ourselves that time. Uh, we need to give ourselves a bit of that time every day. Um, and uh, yeah, I like what Julie, Julia is saying here. Uh, hi, Julia. Um, that, uh, you know, remember that birds and bees do not change for cities. We can plant as many local eco-region plants in our small ways in urban spaces, and this makes a difference. Um, work on redefining the way we see urban landscapes. And I think that there's a lot of creative ways that people are addressing this. Um, uh, you know, guerrilla grafting, rooftop gardens, like there's all kinds of things that are happening in urban centers that are, are bringing in a, a sense of, of wildness back into those areas that's, um, that's necessary for sanity and for the sustaining of our humanity, uh, but also of our reconnecting ourselves to the source of life, which we have uh, been separated from for far too long. Okay, uh, Lizzie says, I've experienced the drain of overloading the brain as a community organizer and leader, and then the healing experience of creating my family farm out of a dried out hay field over many years. After allowing myself to get pulled back into overloading and activist efforts, I am looking for opportunities to go back to the ground centered lifestyle, but with more community. What resources are available for connecting with these communities? Um, I think that that probably depends on what region you're in. Um, I know that 
here in the Northeast, um, there's the Common Ground Country Fair that's coming up here in a, in a week or so. Um, it is a big opportunity for a lot of folks to connect with uh, agricultural communities. Uh, and uh, I think similar things happen in, in other places, uh, but this is a pretty big one. Um, there, there are um, yeah, I mean, there's there's things like intentional communities, um, some of which are agricultural based, some of which aren't. There are ways to to connect with that community aspect. Um, yeah, you just have to, to seek out what's in your area. Yeah, and I think that there are some really wonderful opportunities in different parts of the country. Um, you know that if you just search uh, in your whatever your region is for, um, you know, even opportunities just to work on a farm for a summer and be part of a farming community. Uh, there, there are national sites that you can go on for that um, to uh, to get connected with a farm that's that's looking for people and uh, that's a little micro community in itself, but it's also always tied to the regional larger community of farmers that are that are around there. Um, and as Tim said, there's a lot of uh, intentional communities being formed around uh, agricultural uh, activities right now. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a huge back to the land movement and there's a huge land back movement for indigenous people. So uh, I would encourage you to get knowledgeable about both of those things. Um, and, uh, you know, there are many things similar to common ground country fair in a lot of places. And there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of um, amazing people. Like I, I have friends in Missouri who are um, running an incredible teaching program out there um, that's, you know, permaculture based, but it's really, it goes so much deeper. Um, and and that that would be an incredible place to to go for a period of time to just really upload a ton of information. So um, lots of opportunities um, and uh, you know regionally. So I think um, there's a, how do you suggest sharing the ecocentric mentality? your learnings and teaching with others who have yet to engage with healing and feeling in this way? Is it something that folks have to find their own way to? I think that, um, I think that in some ways people do have to find their own way to a depth of connection, um, but there's lots of things that people can do to, start walking in the direction of, um, of that ecocentric mentality. Um, and, you know, I would encourage you to, to get out of, you know, ecocentric mentality and into a more biodynamic embodiment, right? Like um, we spend far too much time in our heads and far too little time in our bodies. And, and so, you know, when Tim was talking about having his hands in the earth and that information transfer that he got back from the earth. Um, for me, when I was sick, the information transfer that happened for me um, with the earth, none of that was, was intellectual. It wasn't a mental process. It was a totally uh, you know, bodily process. It was, it was a connection through the body. Um, and, and having that connection through the body makes a world of difference. It did for me anyway. Um, and being able to, um, to connect with some, some form of learning that uh, is, is not so mind-oriented. I mean, we're multi-sensory beings, right? And we um, ignore much of our sensory awareness uh, by spending so much time being in our heads. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, um, and this is from Brianna, hi, Brianna. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one of the, one of the challenges for us is to recognize that 
you know, rational thinking is not the only way of knowing. Um, there are multiple ways of knowing, um, but there are also multiple ways of being in relationship with life. And so uh, I would encourage you to get out of, out of your head and stop thinking about this as a mental process and start thinking about um, how do I connect my body to the body of life, which is Mother Earth. Um, and uh, one of the best ways to do that, Brianna, honestly, is to just sit on the earth for 20 minutes every day and to cycle your energy through with the earth. You don't have to know anything. You just have to be present in that process. And in that process, something will move in you or shift in you in a way that will tell you what is the next best thing to do. Um, and so I'm sure that Tim has much more practical advice, which is why we're a really good team. Um, <laughs> so I'll let him take a shot at this too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree that um, it's not as much about the mentality. It's about the, the physicality. And so that's where, um, yes, people do have to experience that on their own. Um, but there are ways that we can share and invite others into that. Um, but it's, it's not about sharing knowledge, it's about inviting into that kind of experience. Um, you know, so, you know, when somebody, when, you know, is getting together for a meeting with your meeting up with a friend or something like that, um, you know, you can invite them into an outdoor space, or if you're in an urban space, you can invite them uh, into a, a park or the edge of an urban space, you know, going for uh, a hike and like a walk and talk sort of thing. Um, or if you're like us, a walk and don't talk. <laughs> we, we like to hike and, and not talk. Yeah, <laughs> even better. Because then you're, then you're really listening to um, that non-human world around right. you. Um, and, and it gives the other person that, that opportunity as well. Um, and it gives them that opportunity to be building their own um, ecocentric or biodynamic embodiment. Um, and, you know, also like food is one of those ways that we experience the physical world around us. Um, you know, so inviting people to uh, a meal with food you've grown in your garden uh, and talking to them about the fact that you grew this in, in your garden, inviting them out to your garden uh, to see what's growing right now, you know, yeah. picking something and letting them take a bite um, is, is an important way that, that a lot of us connect to, to the earth uh, is by physically taking it into our own body and experiencing the reality that um, we have this flow between us. Like that's how we're literally making ourselves out of the earth right. and bringing the earth into ourselves. Uh, so any of those kinds of invitations, I think are a way of, of sharing this with others. And another thing that I do, again, not as practical as Tim is, <laughs> is that I, I like to um, recognize that the water that I'm taking in every day, the water that I'm showering in, um, that we have, a, you know, we have a finite amount of water in the planet. So every bit of water that exists has existed since the beginning of water existing on the planet. Um, it's cycled through all life. It has this extensive memory. Uh, and so I like to sing to my water uh, and I like to um, you know, use water as a mechanism for getting guidance. Um, and, um, and so you can have a relationship with water where you're communicating with the water and asking the water to inform, you know, the water in your being of what is the next right step. Um, and so, um, there are all kinds of things that, that you can do that just, you know, like Tim said, you know, you're having this relationship with food, but we're having a relationship with food, with water, with the air, with the, you know, the ground beneath our feet. Um, all of these things are not resources to be plundered and to be commodified, but these are the sources of our survival. And so, um, you know, reconnecting with those basic sources of our survival and with the essence of life is what we really 
that I need to be getting to. So I've noticed that in the chat, there are quite a lot of resources and maybe everybody doesn't know how they can save that chat to their computer or um, by going down to the bottom of the panel and there are three little dots on the right hand side. And if you click on the dots, it will give you the option to save the chat for yourself. So that um, seems like a, a good good thing to do for a lot of these resources. Um, Sherry and uh, Tim, can you talk a little bit about what the weekend um, would be will be like, what you will be doing? Um, the weekend with us will be a lot like this, because um, we'll still be the same people. Except embodied. And Except actually. embodied, right. Um, and uh, we are actually, we're pretty excited about this, um, that the, the title of the workshop is Exploring the Stories That We Tell. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with our own matrilineal lines. Um, you know, me as the Skijinawak Apid, right? As a native woman from this territory, from uh, uh, uh and this this fella here, whose ancestors came off the Mayflower. Uh, so we're doing intergenerational healing uh, right now, um, but we're going to talk about those stories, and we're going to talk about what are the ancestral stories that we we've carried forward that we might need to let go. And what are the ancestral stories that we need to reach back for and pull for that teach us how to live in relationship with one another and in relationship with life? We're going to look at the narratives that are driving our contemporary society. Um, and then we're going to look at, uh, you know, what are the stories that we need to create now to carry us to a place in the future where we most want to be? Um, what would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. I mean, um, yeah, that's the, the framework of those three kinds of stories of mm -hmm. um, the ones that we need to reclaim, the ones that we need to let go of, uh, and the ones that we need to, to create for, for our unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we'll be inviting everyone into engaging with, with that work of right. um, discovering and unpacking and creating those narratives. Uh, and, you know, in light of what we're talking about today, there'll also be time to actually sit on the earth as well um, and, and engage with the land. Yeah. Well, it, we have a beautiful site to do that in. We don't have cell service, um, but you can sneak off and use the internet if you want to. Um, as I said, you know, when I introduced you both, I said I was really thrilled for what this program represents. And, and what I meant by that is, is it speaks to the heart of what the Rose Center is about, of this intersection between spirituality and social change uh, and personal growth and creativity and nature, all of the things that we talk about, but what it sounds like you're going to be doing is pulling those things together in a way that I think is really important. We all know the famous, you know, the famous quote that the arc of justice is long. But the question is, uh, and this is the question that we, 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 we ask our activists is, do you have the stamina to sustain yourselves so that you don't burn up and you don't burn out? And it seems that that's at the heart of what you're gonna be talking about and addressing. So I'm really excited to welcome you both. And I hope that, um, that, that as many of you who can, can, will join us as well. So thank you. And I think I think Arthur, I just want to add that you know the key to um, not burning out is to know when to step back, when to reground, and when to plug into those who are coming up behind you, um, so that you can help fuel their fire, um, and that way we all continue to move forward together. So. Great. We hope thank you, you again. a lot of that. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you again, and thank everyone that's that's joined us. Um, we will be sending you uh, a link for the recording that you 
are free to share uh, with as many people as you'd like. Um, our purpose is not just to bring people to row to have an experience, but also to be able to project something important out into the bigger world. And thank you for helping us do that.